right, finally we're going to get into our very last video of this summer session. You have been very patient to watch all of these videos diligently. And uh, so now we get to uh, get to our last one. Robust multi-input, multi-output stability. Uh, so we're going to, we have a number of different topics within this subtopic. Uncertainty types. So here we illustrate a number of different uncertainty types. So here is this uncertainty type. This is an additive uncertainty. So we have we have our nominal plant in parallel with our uncertainty. So the two add together. So that's why it's called additive uncertainty. W is a weighting matrix, and generally the the weighting matrix is chosen so that um, the norm of delta can be less than or equal to one. Okay, so W takes up whatever gain there may be that would uh, make it so that this is something else. So even, even if the uncertainty is small, for example, I mean, if you know it's small, for example, 0.1, then this can be, say, 10, in which case, in which case the if you if you scale this by 10 then I'm sorry if you scale this by 0.1 then this becomes magnitude 1 so we can absorb whatever scaling so that this is essentially something that we know is has um, infinity norm equal to 1 multiplicative uncertainty notice that this looks very similar to this in, in the sense that this is now parallel but it's parallel with 1 and all of this together then multiplies our plant. And so this is called multiplicative uncertainty because our uncertainty appears in this form. Here is a similar form, but instead of going forward, we get a feedback uh, appearing. And so this quantity now appears as an inverse. And <clears throat> the difference between these two is you can think of this having the uncertainty in the numerator and this having the uncertainty in the denominator. And of course you can combine these things and have multiple uncertainties as well. Here is another feedback. So instead of having the plant following the uncertainty, here the, the uncertainty part follows the, um, the plant. And then this feedback form basically is such that we actually are having a loop around our plant. So this is, uh, these are the, these are standard forms for uncertainty. Okay, so, or, or typical types of forms. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move toward a standard model for uncertainty. And so this is our model for uncertainty. Um, so we have in general, um, two different kinds of inputs to our system, two different outputs to our system. Here I have W and Z, and here we have C and theta. And so the, the, the feedback uncertainty is the kind of thing we're actually looking at here. So this is the kind of situation where G here may include a controller. That, that is, there may in, be internally within this a control loop, and W then is the external inputs that could be either uh, a disturbance, a noise, or even a reference input. Okay, so, and Z are the things we want to keep small. So if there is a controller that's being applied to this system, it's embedded within here, and, and then we have these kinds of inputs. So we have a disturbance input, or a, some kind of what they, what they call exogenous input. These are our regulated outputs. Those are the things we want to keep small. And then this output is the output that feedback feeds back onto our, our uncertainty, and then this input is the input from the uncertainty. So notice that the weighting function is also embedded in here. Okay. So we have two inputs, two outputs. We have four transfer functions that that occur. Okay. Now with the constraint that theta is equal to delta times c for pitchfork then we have this closed loop transfer function. So once we've closed the loop, then we have the input w, the output z, so the transfer function from w to z is given by this expression, okay? And this system must be stable 
for all uncertainties. So that's when we talk about stability here, we're talking about stability with respect to the uncertainties here. So we, we notice we have a number of transfer functions in this, m, n, j, and l. They form this closed loop transfer function. Okay, And so if we look at the transfer functions, j, l, m, and n, and delta, we've assumed that they're all stable in this model. Okay, So here we've, we're assuming we've applied a transfer, a, a controller. We've stabilized it using some controller, and now we have these transfer functions. So these transfer functions include the controller, and so we're going to assume these are all stable. And we're also going to assume our uncertainty is stable. So assuming those now are all, are all stable, uh, so, uh, so again, it's assumed there's some controller embedded in here that makes it so. So even though J, K, L, and M are all stable, so this is stable, this is stable, that's stable, and that's stable. What we don't know is whether or not this quantity is stable. So M is stable and delta is stable, but we don't know if this inverse quantity is stable. So, and we, we can't know it specifically because we don't know delta. So as far as the uncertainty is concerned, in terms of robust stability, only M and delta affect the stability condition. So even though we have all of these other things going on, all of these other quantities, they're all stable. And so the only thing we need to concern ourselves with is this quantity here. And so we have a version of the small gain theorem that says the matrix I minus M delta inverse is stable for all delta, such that del uh, for all delta such that it has infinity norm less than or equal to one, if and only if the infinity norm of M is less than one, strictly less than one. Again, this is, this is one of those if and only if conditions. And it's part of the reason we're allowed to, we're able to have if and only if is because we're considering all delta with this. If we restrict our attention to a specific delta, it's possible that we can have a delta such that um, uh, a delta less than or equal to one and m greater than one for which the system is stable. Okay, so, but this will be stable for all delta with norm less than or equal to one. So basically, this tells us that the loop gain m delta must have infinity norm less than one. So the infinity norm bounds the, the delta and m. And it basically requires that both of these be stable. If m is greater than or equal to one, it can be shown that you can find a delta that makes the closed loop system unstable. To prove the sufficiency, we note that for any vector v and any s in the right half plane, this is a vector. So once we've multiplied by this vector, this is a vector. We look at the two norm. And we can show that this two norm of this difference is greater than or equal to v times i minus the m delta times v in norm. And so this quantity here, notice that v is a, a constant vector. And so this quantity is greater than or equal to this quantity, where we have the sigma max of this. Okay, So this inequality ass assumes the, the maximum. Um, and then sigma max of this quantity is the in infinity norm. I'm sorry. The infinity norm of this quantity is going to be greater than or equal to this, because the infinity norm is taken over all s. And so we can show this inequality, and that, in fact, this inequality is greater than 0. OK, so, so this, um, so the reason this is greater than 0 is because this quantity, this product, is strictly less than 1. And so v, so I can factor out v2 from all of this. And so I have 1 minus this quantity. But 1 minus this quantity is strictly positive. The norm of the, v, the 2 norm of v is strictly positive. And so that's where this inequality comes from. So this is greater than 0. And since this holds for any vector not 0 and any s, then we know that this quantity has no 0 in the right half plane. So since this quantity is has uh, 
is strictly positive, then we know that the inverse exists and is stable. So this is the basis for robust stability. Now we're going to look into next recasting problems into the standard form. So we, we've seen the different, the different kind of forms, for example, additive uncertainty and um, multiplicative uncertainty and so forth. So how can we put those into the standard form? Because the theorem that we're looking at includes an M here. Okay, not a P naught, not a W. And so the question is, how, how does P naught and W correspond to the M in, in this theorem? So that's, that's the next part.